Good morning. Is this on? Is it on? Hiking, and then they organize hiking trails and stuff. Horseback riding. Good morning. Good morning. Not on? Energy. A lot of stuff. A lot going on. What do they do Good. Uh, with the video? <coughs> Good morning. Please take your seats. My name is Douglas Ferrer and I work at the Aspen Institute Congressional Program. The United States is undergoing a massive demographic shift driven by immigrants and the political implications and the future electorate have been in the forefront of the minds of both parties. Last Thursday, the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration reform package with bipartisan and overwhelming support. And this was cheered by different, different types of people like Jeb Bush, Karl Rove, and President Barack Obama. That very same day, Speaker of the House John Boehner said, for any legislation to pass the House, it's gonna have to be a bill that has the support of the majority of our members. Several key House Republicans have vocally opposed a pathway to citizenship for the millions of undocumented workers in the United States. But for many Democrats, this is the key element in securing their support for any immigration legislation. It is in this incredibly complex and difficult political environment that our panel, moderated by Jason Grumet, will analyze the impact of demographics, immigration law, and the future of national politics. Jason is the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. In 2007, he founded it along with four former US majority leaders to develop and promote bipartisan solutions to the country's most difficult public policy challenges. With immigration policy, he has his work cut out for him. So please join me in welcoming Jason Grumet and his panelists, Admiral Thad Allen, Henry Cisneros, and Al Cardenas. Thank you. Well, thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. We come here uh, to talk about something which has obviously been very prominent in the news of late. And before I introduce our panelists, I just want to reflect for a moment on the topic of today's um, discussion, because it speaks a little bit to the ethos uh, of the Bipartisan Policy Center. So we're here to talk about can we get past politics to reform immigration? And if we all wanted to take a hike, I could simply say no, and we could all go enjoy the splendid blue skies and uh, sterling aspen trees. Um, because I think that the title betrays a certain notion that um, politics are in the way. At the Bipartisan Policy Center, our view is actually that politics are the way, that the fundamental anchor of our democracy is the constructive collision of ideas when proud Democrats and Republicans come together in that political process. When Senators Dole, Dashiell Baker, and Mitchell came together in 2007, they were eager not to say tisk tisk it was better when, uh, when we were in charge. So our view is to emphasize the P in bipartisan and in, to essentially embrace that big hot mess that is democracy. And if you look at the last several weeks of this immigration debate, it actually speaks to, I think, one of the best moments uh, in recent political history. There were hundreds of amendments debated in the Judiciary Committee. There was a week of full-throated, angry, and engaging, and ultimately uh, effective debate in the Senate. And now, consistent with the imagination of our founders, we are going to move to the House of Representatives. And the idea that Speaker Boehner saying the House will work its will is seen as somehow an insult to the goals of uh, effective democracy is something that I think we fundamentally don't uh, abide. So I think there is a real opportunity to reform immigration. But we're not going to take the rims off and say, hey, let's play basketball. We're going to do this with politics and through politics. But I think if anyone imagines that the House of Representatives is just an unfortunate obstacle in the democracy, they're not going to have a very effective time uh, helping that body get to yes in the next several months. Um, with the imagination of proud Democrats and Republicans, uh, we have a terrific panel for you today. And I will do some quick introductions, and then we will get started. To my immediate left is Henry Cisneros. Henry was elected in 1981 when he was four years old, to the uh, mayor's office in San Antonio, where he served a proud and effective four terms. He was appointed by President Clinton to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. After that, he was the CEO of Univision. And he is now the executive chair of City View, which works with urban home builders to create housing in 13 states and 60 communities for average American families. Henry's also a stalwart at the Bipartisan Policy Center. We, in fact, tease him that he is a BPC recidivist. He has um, been a member of our debt reduction project led by Pete Dominici and Alice Rivlin. He recently completed an effort co-chairing a program on what the federal government's role should be in housing policy, along with George Mitchell, Kit Bond, and Mel Martinez. 
and he is now a co-chair of our Immigration Task Force, along with Haley Barber, Ed Rendell, and Condi Rice, and he's been a terrific ally. Nice Thank to you. see you this morning. Thank you, Chase. Next to Henry is uh, Al Cardenas. Al is an attorney, a business leader, and a major contributor and leader in the conservative movement here in the United States. He currently co-chairs the American Conservative Union. He twice chaired the Florida Republican Party. He was a leader in the Reagan transition team. And I'm also proud to say he is a member of our immigration task force. And finally is Thad Allen. Thad is the executive vice president of Booz Allen Hamilton, where his efforts work with the leadership of the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security. He has had a distinguished career in the Coast Guard, retiring uh, in 2010 after uh, more than a few years as the 23rd Commandant of the Coast Guard. He's kind of the Ghostbusters, who are you going to call guy? In 2005, he was named uh, Principal Federal Officer in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and Rita. In 2010, President Obama appointed Thad the National Incident Commander after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And recently in 2012, Governor Cuomo named Thad to the commission that uh, they are developing uh, preparedness responses in the kind of post-Hurricane um, post Sandy. So if you ever have a big problem, one of these three guys uh, should be high on your list. So I want to move now into uh, the formal topic of our discussion. As was mentioned last Thursday, the U.S. Senate, by a vote of 68 to 32, passed comprehensive immigration reform legislation, which is a pretty profound achievement. And I'm looking at Becky Talent, who was our uh, immigration uh, project director who was working for Senator McCain in the 2007 debate, and uh, she could tell you more than anybody what a profound achievement it is to get 68 members of the U.S. Senate to vote in favor of immigration reform, let alone anything. Worth noting that uh, all Democrats and 14 Republicans, so a third of the Senate Republicans, voted in favor of the bill. What we'd like to try to do in the next 35 minutes or so is loosely cover three topics. So first of all, why does this matter? Why is immigration reform important to the future of the country? I want to talk a little bit about what happened in the Senate and see if that can reveal some insights on key issues like border security and the path to citizenship. And then finally, I want to talk about where we go from here. What does this look like for the House of Representatives? And what does it say about our ability as a country to solve big problems. So to get things rolling, I think, Henry, I'll start with you and just um, share with us, well, why is this important? Why is immigration reform? Well, there's a lot of reasons why it's important, Jason. First of all, let me thank uh, Al and Thad for being part of this uh, panel, distinguished Americans with a great uh, deal of experience in this realm. And Jason, thank you for creating the Bipartisan Policy Center. It's an idea whose time has come and is never more important, I think, than now. And, uh, the truth of the matter is, it wouldn't exist if it hadn't come out of your sort of fertile idea. And, Feverish uh, brain. <laughs> and you've stuck with it well over these years, and it's produced uh, important things already. Lots of reasons why immigration reform is important. I'll focus on just one, and that is the reality that we have some 12 million people residing in our country who are here undocumented. They are not legal. Uh, about 10 million of those are Hispanic. I live among some of those in my hometown of San Antonio, Texas. And one can quarrel about how they got here, why they came. The truth of the matter is immigration is very much a push and pull phenomena, pushed by circumstances in their home countries, but pulled by the jobs that need to be done in this country. And we need to have that workforce to do things like construction, in the hot sun of Texas and Arizona in the middle of the summer and, and crops that need to be picked. As we speak now, there are thousands of people in the Central Valley of California picking the fruit that makes its way to our tables here. Um, and uh, the, the simple truth is they live in a second-class status, a dangerous status for them and for us. Uh, they uh, live in the shadows. Um, they can never contribute to our country in the way they could if they were freed to be legal. Uh, so it's just very difficult for the country to uh, uh, operate, to function with 12 million people in an illegal status. Police officers will tell you that, mayors will tell you that, community leaders will tell you that. So we need to fix that aspect of the system. That's one important reason why this is the case. Some would say, we'll just leave it be. It's really unacceptable. Some would say, well, figure out a way to deport them, even create structures where they can self-deport. It's not going to happen. So we've got to just face up to the fundamental reality that we've got 12 million people. We have to deal with that, that aspect. And that's part of why immigration reform is important. 
So Al, you are in the crucible. You are a leading American conservative and you are a leading advocate for immigration reform. Explain yourself. Yeah, thanks. Well, <laughs> well, unique, it's unique in that I'm a first generation American and also a conservative and, and a traditionalist. And uh, America, as, as we know, was, was founded on the concept of immigration. We, uh, we became a country that was vastly underpopulated. Uh, and then when William Polk decided that St. Louis wasn't enough for a western border, we wanted to go to the Pacific, think of the challenges we had, 1840s on. Uh, great, massive, beautiful country with, uh, with too few people uh, to, to, to let it be all it could be. And so we, became, we began a massive immigration policy that worked perfectly until this day whether it was railroad workers or workers for the Industrial Revolution or, or whatever it was, America always found that without a sound, robust immigration policy, we could never grow to be the best we could be. The miracle of America has been its assimilation. When you take people from so many different walks of life and, and all of whom have come from different cultures and places and you turn it into a great country we are, well, that's a pretty cool place. And so why is the environment so different today? Well, it's so different because it's filled with fear and anxiety and, and concern about our future. For the first time in America's history, we wonder as to whether we are underpopulated. Uh, we, we have questions about what our immigration policy going forth should be. I came to America at a time when, when perhaps 80% uh, or so of the American population was what we call a white Anglo-Saxon population. And uh, if my life expectancy turns out to be true, it may be a minority population by the time I'm dead. An incredible difference in just one person's generation or life cycle. And uh, many Americans wonder, gee, where do we go from here? In the 1950s, you know, we were 50% of the GDP of the world. Today, it's perhaps less than 20%. Not because we've done so bad, but because everybody else has done so well. And so in the era of globalization, that's brought great anxiety to America, in the era of, of, uh, of America thinking that maybe we're getting populated enough, just ask some of our environmental friends, you wonder what our policies ought to be. And so that's really the background as to why there's so much emotion. I mean, look, fixing our borders, coming up with appropriate visa quota system, things of that nature ought to be something we fix. But the things that we have to come to terms of a nation are a lot bigger picture. And that is, what should our immigration policy be? How much are we willing to, to, to look a little different in this transformational age? And how confident we are that the American way of life will endure no matter who comes to our shores and is assimilated? And that's a fundamental, profound question that, uh, that is the underbelly of this tension that we're living in. And until we come to grips with that, immigration reform will always be a difficult task to, chat, to, to handle. And I think we'll be talking to groups of that very shortly in the House of Representatives. Um, so that you literally spent your career saving Americans and protecting the sovereign borders of the country. What kind of a reflection does that give you on where we are and the, the challenges of reforming immigration laws? Well, when I first met Gil, I was the regional commander down in Miami. And I used to tell everybody down there that in forcing immigration laws and dealing with the really difficult problems we had down there, that we lived at the confluence of great waters and great passion. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the execution side of policy, what has to be done day to day on the streets and the boats, on the border, at the ports of entry, uh, the issues related to policy making as they are transitioned into execution uh, become very, very important for the, the executive branch, which has to take those policy decisions from the legislature and actually convert that into activity and performance out there. So. Uh, as I've seen this evolve back to the mid-1980s when we had the first, uh, re most recent significant uh, immigration reform, there were a couple of things that we didn't get quite right, including em employment verification and follow-on enforcement structure. So we would know exactly how to do that. <clears throat> so as we go forward and we have this, uh, this policy debate, which needs to occur, I'm from Tucson, Arizona originally, and I understand the communities down here and the impacts. I think we need to talk about uh, feasibility affordability and effectiveness as it relates to the mandates that come out of legislation and how effectively they be, can be executed because ultimately it is career people, whether they're uh, in the military, uh, law enforcement or civilians that are working out there that actually have to put these uh, policies into practice. 
So I kind of take a pragmatic view of that and we look at the policy implications. As much as we can inform the effective execution, I think we should do that. Right. Jason, can I just add one quick word to your question of why is this important and back up to you know, a very high level. Um, the northern industrial nations of the world are aging very rapidly. Japan is now actually declining in population as of two years ago. This is present company excluded. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, the, the European nations, I saw an analysis the other day, it takes about 2.1 population growth to uh, maintain population sustainability. Uh, Spain is at 1.3 replacement. They are going to start declining in population and may well be a substantial percentage smaller than they are over the years of this century. Similarly, uh, many of the, of, the, of, the, of the European, northern European countries. The United States is aging as well. We have 40 million people over 65. That number is going to be 80 million people over 65 in the next 30 years. We've got 7 million people over 85. That number is going to be 21 million people over 85. That number is going to triple. That is, uh, much of the traditional American population is aging. We have issues, of course, but not like those that Japan and the European nations are going to confront when their population declines, their market systems are restricted, their, everything that requires human power, manpower, military systems, consumer markets, everything else is restricted because of immigration. Our immigrants tend to be younger, they are more fertile, they are composed of people who are energetic, hungry, ambitious, want to work, this is huge for this country, and, and, and this is just a fundamental reality. So we, get to, we, we, we need to work the legal issues of it, but the big picture is this country needs immigration. Yeah, along those lines, think, if any of you follow professional sports, think of free agency. You know, immigration is the ultimate free agent fix to our nation's labor needs. On the high end of the scale, uh, we, uh, uh, we have a very limited quota system for attracting high-skilled workers, and, and uh, we don't graduate uh, nearly enough uh, students in engineering, science, math. Well, immigration is the one way to get the world's best and brightest, many of whom incidentally study in our schools and go back home and allow those nations to leapfrog over us in terms of economic growth. Well, immigration is our way to capture those high-skilled workers who'd love to live in America. Uh, still the land of opportunity and, and, and the best place to live in the world. If we only provide them with a, an appropriate visa system, it allows them to realize their dream here on the low end of the scale. You know, America is in dire need of healthcare workers, hospitality workers, farm workers. And, uh, and that's a way to keep our nation uh, growing strong in these fields as well. So immigration is the ultimate free agency tool to let our country economically be all it can be. And frankly, we're about 20 years behind. You know how many hundreds of thousands of jobs, opportunities we've lost by not having an adequate immigration policy. Hopefully this fix will be one of the most important components of economic growth in our next two decades. Free agency yeah. without having to pay free agency prices like no, Dwight Howard. And no salary cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mr. Secretary Now, I think you both kind of describe what I would call a global commons that we live in right now. And I think one of the things we need to think about as we're looking at policies and how to implement policies is maybe how to reimagine our borders. This includes a facilitation of trade, which is very critical. And rather than looking at just one piece part of it, I think we need to look at what are our sovereign responsibilities in a global commons and have that context as we move forward. So let's talk a little bit. I knew these guys are going to get hard to get going. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the Senate debate and just put this in a little bit of, of context. First of all, you know, we had this gang of eight. And I think it's worth noting that when Democrats and Republicans want to work together in our U.S. Congress, they have to form a gang. <laughs> they don't form a club or a group, but they actually need to kind of gang up to protect themselves mostly from the hostilities of their own party. But we had this courageous gang of eight that you know, rode, I think, what was the very significant momentum coming out of the last election to focus on this issue. But there's also a very significant headwind in this discussion, which we're going to now be focused on a great deal, and that is this question of border security and legalization versus enforcement. And I think part of the reason why that is so challenging is we have been here before. In 1986, under President Reagan's leadership, we passed major immigration reform. The terms of the debate were very similar to the terms right now. And the assertion was we were going to provide legal status for people who were undocumented, and we were going to shut down the borders. 
So that was going to be the deal, right? We were going to make, take care of the people who were here now, and we were going to have a strict border enforcement system so that we weren't going to find ourselves 15 years later with 10 million additional undocumented uh, folks living in the US. And of course, we know what happened. We did legalize um, and you know, provide opportunities for the people who were here. And we did not, in fact, secure our borders. So this is the, the trust but verify anxiety that I think really was very much part of the Senate debate and now is going to become even more intense in the House. So I think I want to really focus a little bit on this question of border security. Why will we be able to do it better this time? And I think I want to kind of start yeah. with you. Um, you think about operational issues and technology. Is it, is it a reasonable aspiration to try to prevent illegal immigration? And do we ever have the capacity or technology to accomplish it? This may not be a, <clears throat> a really good metaphor, but when I think about border security, I tend to think of safe drilling. Mm -hmm. well, has some experience there as well. And I think in both cases, what we're looking at is was an acceptable level of risk to carry out the performance, whether it's in the private or the public sector, to derive the benefit associated with that. Uh, there are areas of our southern border. If you look uh, from uh, the bottom of Texas up towards the Big Bend country, very remote, a lot of uh, private landowners there. Uh, notion of border security as it relates to physical control of the border, I think it's probably not the way to talk about this. It's trying to, trying to achieve the performance that creates an acceptable level of security and risk, uh, risk tolerance that allows us to believe that we can move forward and really uh, generally, uh, generally attack immigration reform. So the, the other way to get something passed right now is to add the word verb surge. Right? So we, we have a border surge. Um, Senators Corker and Hoven um, really unlocked the key to getting 68 votes in the Senate by an incredible investment of resources. 20,000 new border security agents, 700 miles of fencing, an E-Verify system, a biometric system. That was, what's your sense? Was that, was that a good move of public policy? Is that, is that gonna bring support from Republicans in the House or were they gonna well, have to I do more? Well, I think so. Look, uh, the, uh, the, the Republican side, the conservative side, still smarting over the deal that was supposedly made in 86 and not consummated in return for the amnesty provisions of, of our undocumented uh, folks here in this country, we were going to tighten up our borders <laughs> and make sure that we didn't have a repeat performance. Well, the repeat performance has, has happened uh, in, in, in many ways and we would just want to make sure that whatever it was we began to talk in 86 get finished in 2013 with appropriate triggers, appropriate security measures, E-Verify for employment opportunities. And look, after all, regardless of your political philosophy, the rule of law has always made our country special, a place where you can come to and know that more often than not, justice will prevail. And so we want a system that's lawful. We want people, we want to have a rightful quota system. We want people to come to America the right way and we want to have an orderly process. And especially after, you know, the terrorist attacks of, of uh, uh, you know, the early 2000s, you know, we, we look at life differently in our country, for better or for worse. So we want to make sure we know who's here and who they are, and just as we want to know uh, the same information about our, our citizens. And so it's an opportunity to bring back the rule of law, enforce our borders, verify people's employments, everybody pay their taxes and do the right thing. And, and that's what traditionalists want to accomplish in this bill and, and why they're so uh, emphatic about getting it right uh, this time. Jason, if I may, um, just to put border security in the larger context. Mm -hmm. um, since Senator McCain, Senator Kennedy, uh, President Bush advocated a generally accepted framework in the early years of this last decade, 2005-06. We've all labored with kind of a three-legged stool. The first leg is border security and how that has grown to mean things like E-Verify because border security doesn't mean just securing the border with walls and drones and balloons, etc., and radar and all kinds of things, but it also means uh, stopping people from getting into the workplace with verification systems. So that's that whole security agenda, one, one, one leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is legalization because we have these 12 million people here. We also want to allow tech workers in. We want to allow uh, agricultural workers in. So some sort of, quote, guest worker strategy that treats people as legal, not citizens, but here operating legally. So they, they, don't, they don't have to look over their shoulder when they walk into the 7-Eleven convenience store whether there's a policeman nearby because they might get arrested for, 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 for just existing. And then the third piece is 
the path to citizenship, which is the most controversial. Now, the, 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 what, what progressives would say about the linkage of these things is that you really can't have people here legal for the long run and not create some mechanism where they can earn a way to citizenship because America has never had a system of second-class citizenship formalized, a kind of an American apartheid that says, we need you here as a worker, but we'll never give you a chance to become a citizen. So that's the way these sort of pieces are linked. With respect to the border security piece, and let me just uh, close and be brief, as a person who has followed this issue for a lot of years, I have no problem with anything we do to safeguard the border because a border is an element of being a sovereign nation. If you don't have established borders, then what's the purpose of being a nation if you can't say who comes in and comes out? So uh, the, the, we have a right to do that by any means uh, that are reasonable. And now, uh, 10 years after that last discussion, uh, there's new technology at the workplace. There's new technology at the border. So these, all of these pieces, I think, are, are, are important, but it is critical that they be linked because otherwise we end up with something that just doesn't work for the long run. Mr. Secretary, you're, you're right. Uh, <clears throat> the big difference between 1986 and now is the change in technology. Right. And I think if we don't take advantage of that in the execution of whatever policy is promulgated by the uh, Congress, we're going to make a huge mistake and not make a leap forward. If you look at uh, high performance computation, spectrum bandwidth, as it relates to even processing records, uh, cloud analytics, ability to use unmanned systems, and biometrics, which is taking a major step forward. I think uh, if we fail to do that, we're really not going to achieve the goals in an effective way as we can. Yeah, maybe Jason, we can start talking a little bit about what lies ahead in this in this journey. Uh, you know, the the speaker mentioned, as as Jason uh, stated earlier, that uh, we're going to go through regular order. You know what? Most bills go through regular order. There's that's not an alarming thing to say. He also said regular order as opposed to as opposed to bringing up a bill like uh, the Senate did. The Senate uh, didn't go through a committee process. The Senate went through a, uh, through a more informal process that gathered steam and ended up on the floor by circumventing what the normal process is for vetting bills in committee. Well, this bill is going to be vetted in committee, primarily the Judiciary Committee, uh, and, and then, it's, uh, then it's going to go through a second process that, that the, uh, the Speaker mentioned, which is at his discretion, and that is he wants to bring a bill to the floor that uh, that's acceptable a majority of Republicans. And that, that bill will eventually get to the floor. Hopefully a version of immigra comprehensive immigration reform uh, will be voted on. And then you'll go into conference. That's a, that's a second remaining inflection point where the Senate uh, Majority Leader Harry Reid and where the Speaker Boehner appoint conferees. Those are pro that's probably the most significant decision that either will make in seeing to it that there's a strong probability that comprehensive immigration reform will take place, because these conferees will agree on, on, on a comprehensive immigration reform package that they deem acceptable to their own body. And so once that's agreed upon in conference, it is that one bill that's agreed to in conference, the same bill that will go to the Senate, that will go to the House for an up or down vote. And so, uh, that's, uh, those are two remaining points of inflection, the, uh, the, the, the uh, conference process and, and then the eventual vote uh, for the bill. So there's no doubt that the House bill will be somewhat different for no other reason that, that we have a, you know, we have a Democrat-led Senate and a <coughs> Republican-led House and wherever that happens, each chamber wants to feel its own sense of independence. If both chambers were led by the same party, you probably have a slightly different version of what's going to take place, but, but that'll be the case. And, uh, and so what uh, lies ahead is a, it's a bit of a, of a difficult road, but certainly a challenging one, but certainly not insurmountable. So can I just comment on a couple of points that Al uh, referred to, because I think that's, this, that's the process we all hope will play out. Um, just a couple of comments, just random comments. First, on the Senate side, what a courageous thing the Senate did, including Republican senators like Marco Rubio, who had a lot on the line on this and did the right thing in linking the key pieces together and saying uh, all of these go together and then getting that great vote that they got out of the Senate. So that was a really, really wonderful uh, demonstration of American democracy at work for the right thing. 
On the House side, the Speaker has made the game very difficult uh, by uh, saying that uh, a majority of the Republican caucus, some 232 members, have to support whatever comes out before it goes to the full House. Uh, now, the difference between the House and the Senate on immigration is pretty substantial. It's not just Democrats and Republican differences, but it's inherent in the makeup of the bodies. The uh, Senate uh, are representatives of entire states. Uh, every state has immigrants and Latinos in it, but not every district of the United States does. In fact, in congressional districts, there are some 70 congressional districts that have less than 10% immigrant and Latino population. So they're not, they, they don't, this is not an issue that moves them very much. And 90 members of the House are Tea Party. So you start with a really, really big issue when you say, I gotta have 120 plus of just on the Republican side before we'll consider it as a matter of national policy as in the House as a whole. So that's a thing to watch. It's gonna be very difficult. They also, the House the leadership is saying, they don't want a comprehensive bill, they want each of the major pieces, uh, agricultural workers, tech workers, um, uh, the border security, E-Verify, and maybe not path to citizenship. So it will come out, comp I mean, it'll come out as pieces and missing a major piece, which crazes, creates great legislative issues in terms of how the conference works. So all of these are things to watch uh, you know, as we go forward. It makes it a very, very difficult path, as Al has said. But there's a lot in here that the country needs to be watching and deciding, is this the way we want a major issue of this kind to be resolved? And to demonstrate why we're a bipartisan task force, I'm here to differ a bit from my colleague <laughs> okay. in terms of that version of, of, the, of the chamber. The, uh, the bills that the House is vetting through the Judiciary Committee are are, are, are more single issue bills, you know, security, border security, verification are treated separately, the, the uh, legal immigration quota system is treated separately, but eventually, eventually, that's more a process than an indication of will, eventually these separate bills have to be consolidated in order for them to go to conference unless a Senate majority leader would be willing to take them separately, which he won't. So. So my sense is that once these bills are vetted and voted on separately in the House, which for the, for the Senate, it's a different makeup of a body, different chemistry in the House. The best way, given the, the, the chemistry of that body, is to take these one by one if you, if you hope for eventual passage. A little bit longer, more difficult journey, but, but the most likely to succeed. You eventually will then consolidate these various, these various pieces of legislation and then you send them over to, to the Senate would be the, the way to handle this. I think the Speaker, uh, in dealing with the realities of, of his body, uh, wants to make sure that, that his members feel like they've had their say. Now, because he's invoking this informal rule of a caucus majority, the bill will more likely be more conservative as it comes out than it would have been had there been a vote and the uh, had it gone directly to the floor for a fuller vote, which means a little bit harder work in the uh, uh, in conference and then eventually in passage. But but I think the speaker, rightfully so, was concerned that with the emotions at hand, uh, if he didn't if he didn't make that that uh, process determination, uh, this could have blown up before it had a chance, and that's I, that's what he did. I think there'll be another process issue they're going to have to work through the. Uh a lot of the resources that are uh, noted in the Senate bill are to be sourced from the uh, uh, Comprehensive Immigration Trust Fund. And there's also an appropriations process that will be working through the House on the annual appropriations process. And you also have sequester out there. That's a really complex interaction of, uh, of uh, different mandates and different responsibilities that have to be worked through. Yeah. So the timing is also going to be, of course, very important. Um, Speaker Boehner on July 10th is kind of having an all-hands caucus meeting where they're gonna bring the entire Republican caucus together and essentially say, so what do you all think? Which I think is also demonstrative of what, what Al was saying, which is that he is not going to be you know, jamming any legislation, certainly not the Senate legislation through this process. Our sense right now is that the House will be moving these five bills forward. They probably are not gonna pass many, if any of them, by the August recess. So I think a key moment for this debate is gonna be the hot August recess. And I think there are certainly those who believe that 
they can use that time to mount opposition to the legislation. I think our task force and others are going to be very active in trying to make sure that there are constructive dialogues happening. But this is a debate that's going to go into um, probably throughout the rest of this year. I think one thing that is also very important to recognize is how much conservative support there is for this legislation. And I think Al uh, you know, is certainly a, a leader of that. But the Chamber of Commerce has been very supportive. Um, there have been a significant number of um, conservative organizations running advertisements in Florida trying to support Senator Rubio for his courageous move. Um, I think this really does have the uh, makings of a different kind of bipartisan conversation than we've had in a long time. Um, but to Henry's point, the one thing missing from the five House bills is anything on path to citizenship. It doesn't even include a, a DREAM Act component, which is kind of the easiest aspiration when people think through the path to citizenship. So this House and Senate conference is really going to be an incredibly interesting and challenging moment. And I think Speaker Boehner is going to have a courage moment. And I think he knows it. My sense is he's saving that for when it really matters. I think that the legislation that comes back from that conference um, is probably going to have to have an up or down vote throughout the whole body. Um, I think that's going to be the place where he's really going to have to, to lean in. Um, I think strategically his effort to not throw it all down there in the second inning um, is probably right, but it's going to require some patience in the advocacy community as well um, to recognize that that's going to have to take its and, and Jason, um, it may be more than the speaker having a courageous moment. It may be the country that has a, 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 a moment, the body politic as a whole, the political system as a whole, on the question of path to citizenship. Because it could well be that we come to an impasse and there's a, there's a choice to be made, and that is, do you want legislation that legalizes but doesn't create a path to citizenship? Somehow that moment may come. And uh, obviously the progressive and Latino community believes that you can't have this without a path to citizenship. I've described it as a three-legged stool. It requires all three legs to stand. Um, but, you know, we may have a very, 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 very uh, a moment, and then it may get really ugly. It may all just be punted to the uh, 2014 election, and uh, uh, both sides see some advantage in pointing at the other and say, you failed, you failed, you dropped the ball, you dropped the ball, and use it on election issue in 2014, which would be a tragedy, and which would be the kind of thing that the Bipartisan Policy Center wants to work against. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think that the most persuasive thought process for the speaker is going to be, what are the consequences of failure to pass comprehensive immigration reform? Uh, look at what happened when we didn't pass it in 07, where we stand today. We have exponentially increased the burdens, the challenges, the, the, the miscues of, of, not, of, of the consequences of not passing immigration reform. Now that that problem has exponentially grown, uh, think 10 years ahead because, you know, there's only an appetite for dealing with these major issues every so often in Congress. Think of the consequences a decade from now of not passing immigration reform. And I think at the end of the day, that is the ultimate question that each of these members must gauge before they cast their vote. And as Al and I were talking last night, <clears throat> the failure to pass immigration reform is going to place the entire law enforcement community in a very uncomfortable position because you have this large body of people that are not here in a legal status. And how do you handle that moving forward without any policy guidance? Jason, as we go to questions, just one quick 30-second uh, point that goes beyond immigration reform. It's my great hope that after we get some sort of uh, consensus in the country and pass a law that deals with reform, then we begin to think about the real on the ground question, which is how do we integrate these people into American society? Because I personally believe they are a hugely important part of building the kind of America that we want. And the, ch the choice is between keeping them in a, a kind of an underemployed, undereducated, underproductive status with their children being in the same situation or full integration in American society, which means learning English fluently, uh, learning how to manage finances, getting the skills to work, learning about our educational system so that children have the proper in-family cultural push to get an education, and all of the other things we need to do to make these to transform the next generation from farm workers to engineers. And uh, that's, that's something that the society needs to be thinking about beyond just the, the technical writing of an immigration reform. It will take a whole of community response by the federal government, state and local governments, 
private sector, non-governmental organizations to make this work. So we have a number of other topics we have not yet covered, but I'd like to, to pause now and um, see if folks want to interact with this panel. I think we have a question right up front. We have some mic runners. They're very fleet of foot. Um, <laughs> try not to trip them. <laughs> And please let us know who you are when you ask your question. Hi, good morning. Jose Wilson, math teacher in New York City and a scholar here. Um, I have, well, one thing I haven't heard in the debates really is how do we get entities, whether public, private, to really discuss um, the management of undocumented workers in the country as well? I think there's a discussion that needs to be had there. Of course, as an educator, I do teach children who may have questionable statuses here. But at the same time, I also think about the parents and the home situation. So, um, I, and of course, this is a bipartisan. There could be a solution on either end of the aisle. I mean, my question more is, how do we hold those entities accountable to the management of undocumented workers? If I, I'll, Please. I'll start. Um, uh, one of the things that we've done in the past in American history is create literally a, a function of government, which is the to, to improve the integration process. Did it at the turn of the last century when uh, everybody understood the importance of, quote, Americanizing uh, the immigrants. Now, today, uh, purists will, uh, you know, say that's, that's not a good concept. We want more of a, of, of a you know, kind of a, a respect for heritage and so forth. But I personally think it's exactly the right concept. It is incumbent upon us to create an understanding of American values in the immigrants, and so we'll need, as Thad said a moment ago, a whole series of institutions, governmental, at Homeland Security and other, uh, Department of Education and other places, uh, to, for, for language instruction and, and, and other things, as well as NGOs, nonprofits, working on the ground on, on, on finding a way to, to help people who really want to enter the mainstream of American life. But, they want the English classes. But you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I live that experience in Miami every day, and I've got, you know, friends and colleagues in the construction industry, manufacturing industry. Uh, they will employ laborers who came uh, from elsewhere, and uh, Haiti, Cuba, you know, Caribbean, South America primarily. And it's, you know, they say, look, these people start out with a good will, but without really a good idea of the free enterprise system, America ascendancy, says within a year and a half, just a free enterprise system, the sense of American values, responsibility, but more important than anything else, the pressure from their new colleagues to, to assimilate is, is an incredible force. I believe that it's the American people themselves, more than institutions, that will be helpful in this assimilation process. I live it every day in Miami. Uh, they become you know, friends and colleagues of co-workers. Co-workers are part of the American fiber. They instill in them the same spirits they have learned, and you pass it on accordingly. I, you know, I don't uh, underestimate by any means the, the infrastructure support that Henry's alluded to. I, I just say that complementing it is the greatest source of, of uh, assimilation, and that is your new colleagues in the workplace. Sure. Some other questions? Who's close to the light, please? Yeah. We'll go here, we'll, we'll, we'll go right to left. My name is Warren Klug, I'm a hotel general manager here in Aspen. Um, fully half of my employees are immigrants, uh, mostly uh, south of the border. Um, we've heard on the Republican side that uh, uh, these efforts to uh, bring in more Republicans um, through the increased border security, we've heard a lot of people say, well, it's not gonna do it. It's smoke and mirrors, it really won't happen. We don't trust it'll happen. Therefore, we can't get on board. Will it work? Will these efforts in this most recent amendment uh, really create a change? You're talking about the security of security the border. Security of the border, right. I think just to, to, to frame the question and then yeah. kick it over to Thad, right? This is a place where there's an, I think, very workable solution in two polar positions, neither of which to us at the BBC make a lot of sense, right? One is to say it's all inputs. And what the, what the border surge is is a lot of inputs. It basically says we're going to invest, we're going to build walls, but no guarantees. The Cornyn Amendment, which failed, was all about output. It said we're not going to allow the path to citizenship to be triggered until we can demonstrate the effectiveness of all these criteria. 100%. 100%. But the criteria were, designed, were described as poison pills, that it was not, in fact, 
a sincere effort to make a trigger that could be achieved, but it was actually an effort to kind of lay down a marker. There's a vast space between do your best and a poison pill. And I think if we're going to see the House of Representatives work its will, it's going to have to find some, some room in that vast space. But now, I think that to you, if you could talk a little bit about, can it work? I mean, with, a, with Well, I mean, let's be honest with each other. Absolute 100% border security is a noble but unachievable goal. So it gets back to what is an acceptable level of security and risk tolerance to allow us as a sovereign nation to manage our responsibilities in a global commons. That includes trade and everything else that's going on on the border. That's the reason I think a functional look at the border is what we need. But if you look at the advances that have been made since 1986, especially in E-Verify, which will become mandatory, that's a mandatory background check on social security numbers for any employment, the ability not only to use biometrics in entry, but biometrics on exit and get a handle on visa overstays and who is here illegally so we know what that population is. It's, it gets back to the three-legged stool analogy. You can't do any of this without making it a comprehensive framework for execution and performance, because otherwise there's going to be ambiguity out there. There'll be creases that aren't covered. And frankly, you're going to leave ambiguity out there in the, in the minds of the people who are actually trying to enforce it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then ultimately, look, why should immigration be different from a cost-benefit analysis and health care, criminal justice, education, and anything else? I mean, our wish list uh, for perfection far exceeds our ability to finance or have resources to tackle each challenge in America to a level of perfection. And so, as Thad said, the real challenge here is having an adult conversation and the cost-benefit analysis of how much are we willing to spend in order to, to achieve acceptable results. And that, that should be the test or the matrix of that debate. And in the absence of that framework, you're ultimately going to leave this to the discretion of local police chiefs, sheriffs, state and local governments. You're going to lack continuity and consistency of how we treat this cohort group across the country. And this stuff will be ended up being settled in the courts, which is the wrong way to do any kind of operation, in my view. You know, Dad made one other very important point on, on visa overstays. And this is just, I think, the, the contours of the issue are so different than in most people's imagination. The majority of people in the last few years who are here illegally did not come across the Rio Grande on an $8 inner tube. They landed on an $80 million Airbus. The majority of people right now who are here illegally are flying in on all different types of visas and just not leaving. And so I think if we really want to understand the challenges, as a number of our speakers imagine, this is not just about the border. It's partly about the border, but it's really much more about how we engage and create the incentives and the enforcement to make sure that people who are here legally can do what they came here to do. And then when it's time for them to go, they return to wherever they originally came from. We can move the microphone in this. You were headed up, you were headed yeah. up. Oh, there. there is a microphone over there. Please, hand off. No, that young man said it's Hi, I'm Claire Dewar and I live in Dallas. And, you know, we really do see the benefits of you know, people that have come either legally or illegally. I have so many people that I do business with that are entrepreneurs and are educating their children, either some of them with private schools because they're saving their money to do that. So the American dream is really being realized. And, you know, so I'm very much supportive of trying to get a, a handle on all this. But I do think that, and you've maybe talked about it very early, but Thad, you know, anybody that's been to the, you know, the border of Texas, the idea that you could actually fence that border, the geography down there, it's like saying, we're gonna border this, you know, we're gonna put up a big fence along, I mean, it's ridiculous. Is that just politically a way to say, okay, we're gonna appease those who think that if we open our country up, that it's going to be, you know, sort of this carrot that we're giving. It just seems like such a waste of money when it just physically, and you know, I can imagine that Arizona's the same thing and New Mexico's the same thing. I mean, that's a rough country down there. Well, I've often said uh, how you view border security depends on where you sit on the border. There's a big difference between the two cent bridge in El Paso and uh, going across the river in Ojanaga, which it may be 90 or 100 miles to the next crossroad. And for a while, the Border Patrol was talking about effective control of the border in lieu of border security, but that's kind of fallen out of favor. What it takes in the big, big country is not what it may take in metropolitan El Paso or Ote Mesa outside San Diego. And I think what you need to do is come up with a set of criteria and the performance you want that mitigates the risk that I discussed earlier, and that may differ 
depending on where you're at in the border. And there are other considerations too, like the amount of produce that comes through the Mariposa Port of Entry in Nogales that we depend upon. And that all, that all becomes part of what I call the functional border. You need to sit and look at it holistically, but you can't prescribe what a level of border security is and mandate it for an entire stretch of the border. It just doesn't work. So let's have three or four more questions. I think we have one right here, and then one in back, and then we'll take two more over here, and then we'll hang around for as long as you'd uh, like. I'm, I'm very much for all, all the three legs, but what is the answer to the question? We're spending so much time on a border that, yes, is long, but probably less than one-tenth of our whole border. So we got, we've got all two oceans and a Canadian border, which, uh, what's the answer? Well, we deal with air, land, and sea, actually space domains, and we have threats around all of our borders that are agnostic to treaties and political boundaries, weather, germs, flows of money, contraband, illegal trafficking in human beings. Uh, we have no ubiquitous uh, surveillance of our maritime borders, but we tend to focus on the southern border. And in fact, when you put pressure on the southern border, as we've seen, then you get migration by sea in Southern California and Mexico and across the Straits of Florida. That's the reason I think you have to take this thing as a system and we have to deal with the entire implementation of policies in relation to immigration reform as an enterprise. It gets back to this whole of community or whole of government approach. Part, a big new part of the system that didn't exist in previous iterations is the verification at the workplace with computerized systems that make that valid, accurate, real-time, um, usable. Uh, and, and what that is intended to do is take the incentive out of people coming because they won't be able to work uh, without being legal. And, 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 and so the E-Verify system is a big, big part of the, of the yeah. system. Yeah, I think you know, the, uh, the greatest, uh, the most significant components of stymieing illegal immigration are one, the greatest, uh, what's the greatest magnet to illegal immigration? When demand exceeds supply of labor, correct? So if you're dealing with an adequate quota system so that demand meets up with supply, market-driven, rather than arbitrary quota driven, then that's one way to stabilize that. that set. The second was what, what, uh, what Henry just said. Nowadays, you can actually get work if you're undocumented. If you get to a point where you can't because the employer sanctions and penalties and consequences are so severe, then you know why do people come to America? They come to America to find opportunity. If they understand that opportunity is not available to those who are not documented, that is the greatest uh, chance to, to stymie legal immigration. And while it's not the point of our discussion here this morning, I don't think you're going to have a larger debate on where we're going uh, in this uh, policy sphere without talking about the north-south threat vectors that exist in this hemisphere. And I'm talking about all kinds of illicit trafficking. And uh, if you're working like I have for uh, three or four decades, uh, trying to work on these very tough enforcement issues, the border to really be concerned about is Mexico's southern border. Uh, Jason, just uh, real quickly, because we haven't talked about it with this group, and that is the traditional argument that's made against path to citizenship is yes, but they broke the law. And uh, the answer to that is uh, then they should pay some penalty. They should pay some price for having broke the law, but, 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 but we're not going to deport 12 million people, so we've got to deal with this in forthright ways. And the Senate bill goes a long way toward establishing some penalties for uh, having come illegally, and the principal one is you got to wait 13 years of process in a legalization state, and then another two years before there's a, a, a mechanism for citizenship. So it's kind of a 15-year process with fines and requirements uh, to have evidence of having abided by our laws and 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 learning the language and a lot of other things. Back that, taxes. Back taxes that I think. Uh, are, should satisfy most people that they're not getting an easy ride to citizenship. Not only that, it's like the ultimate 12-year probation period because yeah. if, you, if you commit a crime during that period of time, uh, the game's over. You're not yeah. eligible. You're not eligible. Right. A couple more questions. Where, who, who, where's the mic floating around back here? Well, why don't you hand it right there, and then we'll have a last question over here, sir, in the blue blazer. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Hulop. Uh, as a student from Los Angeles, like, we see many students that are immigrants or undocumented. And the, some of the reasons is that they come as a very young age, so it's not their fault that they're, for the, they have this kind of status. And 
in addition to that, uh, there are lack of opportunities for those students that want to go to college because once they graduate, they either go to a community college, somewhere area that they don't want to go, they want to go to a university like UC or Cal State, or they just stop and just go into the workforce. So my question is, is why, uh, how can we provide more opportunities for those students with an immigrant or undocumented status? Well, one big part of, uh, of, of, the, of the discussion is the DREAMers legislation that recognizes that there are young people who come in uh, with their parents, very young, before they're of age to have made the decision by themselves, and then they have uh, a path in, in education, the American educational system, that brings them out at a point where they could be very useful to our country. They're, they're ready to go to university. Some of them already in university doing very well. They're the, exactly the kind of talent that we need. So uh, after the failure of the Congress to be able to pass the Dreamer legislation, the president used administrative powers to pass the Deferred Action Program, which said that for, for two years uh, the, 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 those provisions would be in place. And tens of thousands of young people have taken advantage of that. And they're today functioning in our society, you know, going to school without the fear that if they drive a car, they're going to be deported. If they have a, a, a minor uh, scrape with the law, they're going to be deported. Uh, that's hugely important. And, and frankly, one of the pieces of, of, of this that ought to pass, whether anything else, or does, anything else does or not. The, the uh, conservative answer to your question is, is the following, and that is we ought to have a system that uh, provides you with an equal opportunity. Uh, not a guarantee of success. And so we ought to place you in a place where based on your own performance as a student, you'll either be able to go to community college, state university, Brown University, but it all, it's all up to the student and it's her, his or her achievement. Uh, and, and so that's really the beauty of what America should be about is putting you in equal footing to everybody else to, to be able to aspire to, 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 to anything, but, but you've got to earn it. We have time for a final question. We, we can't let you leave without giving a prediction. What's your view, all of you who are so involved in this and aware of it? Will it happen? When will it happen? Uh -huh. Who wants to go first? <laughs> My view, these are kind of confessions of a former budget officer that worked a lot with the Hill when I was in the Coast Guard. I think it will be whether or not the House can fashion a vehicle or a series of vehicles that can get close enough that, put, that we'll put in what we call a conferenceable range. In other words, are the two vehicles close enough where under the rules of the Senate and the House they can actually conference them? Yeah, my answer is it's all going to depend on the, uh, on the magnitude of the effort moving forward. This is a very difficult undertaking in the House. Uh, and, uh, and the Court of Public Opinion is going to be critical to its passage. The advocacy work that it takes by groups like ours is going to be critical to its passage. And I would link its success to the, uh, uh, to, to the degree of effort that's undertaking in assisting the members to come to a right solution. I, I am optimistic that it'll happen. I am not assured that it'll happen. Uh, but I believe that uh, we're, not, we're, we're in a place where if all the efforts that are required are taking place, that it will happen. And I guess I believe that we will have immigration reform before the end of the year. I think that uh, the American people understand there's a level of fairness here, that the, that the Senate did something truly courageous in putting the pieces in place, and uh, that this is not something to attack like we saw a couple of summers ago with the Health Care Act where the country just boiled over the summer and, 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 and created this incredible contentiousness. I don't think that will happen here, and the House will eventually come around to understand they have an obligation to the country as well. So I believe it will happen before the end of the year, but if it doesn't, I think it will carry over into 2014, and, 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 but we will have immigration reform as the, as the right outcome in short order. That's my I opinion. Will, I will embrace that and um, raise the bar a bit in that we focused a lot about what the Republican House is going to have to do. I think that our Democratic president and Harry Reid are going to have to decide to forego the delicious opportunity to blame the Republicans for not abiding by the Senate framework and, in fact, get behind a piece of legislation which they don't like as much, but which is still tremendously advancing the cause. And that's going to be a really tough choice. 
there's going to be some piece of this final bill that the advocacy community and traditional democratic politics is not going to be comfortable with at all. And they will say, well, there's already a lot there that we're not comfortable with. But um, the House is going to do something different. And I think there's going to be a very critical moment of national leadership when our leading politicians decide do they want the issue or do they want to put us on the path of the solution. It's going to be a, it's going to be a tough call. I think they're going to make the right call. Um, but I think that's going to be as much a focus on Democrats at the end of the day as on Republicans. I want to thank you all. I want to thank our speakers. And I also want to do a quick shout out. Well, my five-year-old Adam left after about 20 minutes. My seven-year-old Julia and 10-year-old Isabella have hunkered down throughout the entire forum. And I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the morning. Thank you, everybody.